Happy Wednesday, everyone, and welcome to another fabulous edition of the Greater Lawrence Chamber of Commerce's Chamber Chat. I am Brad Kloppenstein, president of said Greater Lawrence Chamber. Thank you all for joining us. This week, we have an esteemed guest, um, our third state senator in this series. From District 17, Huntington, Indiana, we have with us Senator Andy Zay. Senator Zay, welcome to Lawrence, your home away from home. Home away from home. Good to be with you. Great to be with you. So here we are. We are deep into our stay-at-home COVID. Uh, so let's just start with you. Give us some of your thoughts on what's going on. Give us some pearls of wisdom. And then I have a whole bunch of questions to ask, and we'll probably take some questions from the assembled masses as well. So go right ahead, Andy. Well, let, let me give you a little perspective, first of all. Um, from from a personal vantage point i um we wrapped up in indianapolis in the first week of march second week of march i guess it was i came home and about that time my um I, i'm a very small business there's three of us here and so um when i got home my employee went down and she went down hard and after about a week of struggling with illness she was uh, eventually tested and ended up, um, she did test positive for the COVID. And she was out for approximately a month, a um, month, a little longer than a month, honestly. So she has had it and um, has been through the cycle and is actually back with us now, healthy, working every day. Um, we still got some tape on the walls. We're doing some painting and remodeling uh, since the uh, auto business is a little slower right now. But uh, yeah, Patty is back and with us. The, the other thing, so there's, you know, that's the personal attachment to the disease for me or to the virus for me. And, and the second is, is, is a small business owner. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to perceptually from the outset to have this essential versus non-essential because I believe that all workers are essential. And I, and I, I understand the intent. The intent was to distinguish between um, some businesses that were essential to keep us alive, keep us moving. But uh, that, it's a very difficult uh, label to kind of absorb. So from a small business perspective, that was a pretty tough challenge. Um, another component, I've got a beautiful daughter who's a senior year in high school and her, her spring just completely fell apart. So right when this um, came down and the, um, the rollout came out, uh, as it's been kind of a, um, a legacy of ours and our family, our senior kids, we do the, the spring break trip. So we were all booked, ready to go to Florida. Um, her cousin was actually joining her and my sister and, and her husband. So we had a nice trip planned. Um, in, in iron, ironically enough, my uh, older boy from Purdue was down there with my uh, wife's um, brother and he was going to join us because at that time Purdue had shut everything down. So um, we were going to go, going to go, go right down to the last minute. And so that blew up. And so her world's just been devastated from spring break to prom to graduation. Um, she was even beginning um, her higher ed courses in uh, June and those have now been canceled. So it's just a, uh, it, it's just a reality in our family of, um, you know, that senior year experience that I know a lot of our students across the state, particular seniors are facing, but, but all the students. And so we've struggled with that. Uh, you know, the uh, e-learning was, was not a very glorious experience for her. It's because uh, some of her emotion, you know, she just kind of got off, you know, said, I'm not going to do it. So we had to reel her back in a few times, but we're there. And, uh, you know, she's going to graduate. And, uh, but it, that's been a, a very difficult challenge for her mom and I. And then the other side of the coin is my wife works in the banking business and mortgages were crazy busy heading into this because um, the rates were, were in uh, good shape. They were very low. So there was a lot of refinancing going on. Our friends in real estate have been selling a lot of homes. There's been a lot of turnover in homes. A lot of the developers have been fairly busy. And uh, that's really maintained throughout. So in some respects, a lot of business, a lot of society had slowed down, but my wife's working 11, 12, 13 hour days and is having a hard time kind of even compartmentalizing, keeping her work at, at work and, and being available for the kids and in, in, in our family setting. So it, it has been a whirlwind of emotions. And I guess that's why I share that because we've, we've been everywhere. You know, I go to work all day and my business stinks. It's, it's completely falling apart. So I'm slow. 
you know, we're kind of redecorating here and, and doing things to keep us busy, doing some outreach marketing. I've done some uh, quiet political marketing, just writing letters and staying in contact with people. But my wife, you know, she can't, she doesn't even have time to eat lunch. And then we all assemble in the evening where we, where that has been one of the blessings because we've gotten together. But, um, you know, we're, we're all in many different frames of mind. We, this time of year, my, my 14 year old, we'd be out at, we'd be over at Westfield playing ball or, or bouncing around Midwest playing a lot of baseball. So, um, that's my, that's my personal relationship with all this. So it, it has been extremely difficult on all fronts. And I think we've seen on Facebook, you know, where everybody says, you know, the, you have the one side that says it's all crazy, one side that's very concerned, and one side that's kind of in between. And that's kind of where I'm at, honestly. You know, I do think it's time to, to open up some. I, I understand the real impact that it's had on small businesses in particular and many businesses. Um, the doctors, a lot of them, even the ones that we're listening to from the highest level to, to others that we know, there's been a lot of changing of um, policy and changing of director, directives throughout. But um, we also have to respect this virus. It's, it's very serious. Um, you know, I talked about it uh, with, in relationship to my own employee. Um, the data, you know, in, in those that uh, we're listening to on a regular basis with the governor and his team, and uh, those that I know up here in Northeast Indiana, um, you know, it's, it's nothing to, to take lightly. So it's, it's, it's a combination of everything, and it, it is difficult. It is difficult for all of us. But uh, um, I know that's a wishy-washy answer, but um, I think that's where a lot of people are. I, I think, I think they, they understand the economic belief that we've got to get some things going. They understand the seriousness of it. And then, um, you know, even some of the conspiracy theories, if you will, um, I don't know that you can dismiss all the information surrounding that, certainly some of it, most of it. But I think there have been some valid points made with, with some of the things in between there. So you've touched on a whole lot of things that I want to follow up on. Please do. Um, first, tell me, what kind of communication are you getting from the state house as far as are they seeking your guidance? Has the legislature been consulted on any of this? Or um, are you guys getting the same the information the same time we are? Well, in full transparency, uh, I get what you get. Um, I, I, I will say we have our legislative connections. They're responsive when we ask. Any um, concerns that have come to me as a legislator, I have forwarded down to them and they have responded. Um, but uh, it was six weeks or more before there was an intimate uh, meeting, and what I mean a personal meeting, even with the leadership of the Senate. So it, uh, it took a while for that to come around, and um, we've had a steady flow of information coming out of the Senate leadership. We've created our own COVID website with the frequently asked questions and access to uh, different things that uh, we've tried to be responsive with. But uh, I will say it's been a little bit of a challenge. Um, I mean, I've been on the 230 watch, uh, like many of us throughout the state, um, listening to the governor and whoever he brings in on, on any given day, certainly Dr. Box and her team, but, but beyond that. So, and then with that, it, you and I had a uh, offline conversation on this last night. Senator Jack Sandlin put up a pretty scathing post yesterday evening about the excise police shutting down top golf while the right. state's been saying hey uh golf courses you can reopen in bars and restaurants you can reopen at least at 50 percent capacity uh what are your thoughts on that well first of all you gotta know jack sandlin his background um jack is a uh um, he was a detective he was uh, on the uh, indianapolis police force he has a you know long um successful career in uh, policing and, um, and doing it. And so through that, I will say he was very concerned early on about enforcement of all the executive orders um, before, before the stages and coming out of this. Um, he, he was very concerned about that. And so, you know, I, I support Jack and, and I respect Jack for, you know, his background and foundation. And as the um, stages were released by the governor, I, you know, I was excited. I'm a, I'm a businessman. It's like, let's get going, you know, let's go. 
But what I did realize and what I was concerned about from the outset is, is a little bit of what is happening at Top Golf, what's happened at some of our businesses, what uh, some of the engagement with some of the uh, uh, churches and faith-based institutions throughout the state. The enforcement is the key. And it's, um, you know, I think, I don't know. I, 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 I think... I think some of it, a lot of it could be handled differently. It's just difficult to distinguish one business from the other. As we were just speaking, um, coming, coming online today, um, you know, all, all bars and entertainment venues, or most of them serve food. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of a big component of it. The fact that they have alcohol too, kind of, you know, we're distinguishing between those classes. And uh, the, the encouraging thing, even for the enforcement and, and from the governor's standpoint, has got to be a lot of the, most of these people, from what I've heard, have taken, you know, their responsibilities very seriously insofar as the uh, social distancing and um, some of the masks and those kinds of things. So it's not, it's not just rogue where they're opening up and letting people flow in and do that. And, and I guess I would just like to see, uh, you know, a little more consideration given to that, to the fact that uh, some of these that are, you know, in between type venues would be given a little more latitude. And I think that would serve serve us all better and uh, certainly serve the businesses better because they, you know, these businesses are ready to go. They got bills and they got mortgages and, and the key of the president's initiative um, from the outset through the uh, SBA programs and those is to keep people employed. And so, um, you know, I, I, I can't fault the businesses for trying to do, to trying to get going and trying to, and, and within that trying to do the right thing and play by the, uh, the rules set before them. I just wish the enforcement maybe could uh, be a little more workable and, uh, you know, show a little more latitude. So, do you think the excise police is the right agency to be enforcing that? Oh, that'll be a long debate that could go on for a long time. Um, I, I, I don't know, probably not. I mean, it, when, who, who enforces executive orders? I don't know. I guess the excise police, that's what we found out at this time. But uh, I'm certain that'll become a discussion uh, this winter in our legislative session. So another question I have for you, and forgive me if I butcher the name of the association, but you are president of the Indiana Automo Indiana Association of Autom Automobile Dealers, or something along those lines. Basically, you're the Chamber of Commerce for Automobile, or automobile Dealers. Um, what conversations are you having with your members, and what advice are you giving them? Well, I think it's the same advice, you know, that a lot of the small business associations. I've been networking with NFIB. Um, uh, the Indian Independent Auto Dealers, uh, which you should have that down. You took one of their trophies and some of their awards from their uh, annual golf out. I should have been wearing that. I think you showed a little more respect than that. <laughs> but uh, beyond that, you know, it's it's weathering the times. It's weathering the times. Our friend Damian Mason, um, you know, we've had a kind of a Tuesday night group that's gotten together and you know, it sounds maybe a little silly, but it's been a small business support group where we're, you know, we're whining to each other, but we're, we're holding each other strong and talking about, you know, how far out are you planning? Are you out three weeks? Are you out three months? Are you out, you know, a whole year? You know, what's the reality in this? And, and others that we've seen, um, you know, are, are folding up. So it's, it's just a matter of weathering the times. There's been a lot of guidance with the federal programs, the uh, SBA programs, the PPP and the economic disaster. And uh, we're kind of looking uh, for what kind of relief uh, may continue um, or from the state, because a lot of those dollars now have fallen into the state's hands and uh, see if there is a continuation of some small business um, relief grants. And, and as you know, as a, as a chamber executive and, and your folks here from the chamber, the small businesses are the key to our, to our communities, to our United Ways, to our baseball programs, you know, what will become our football or basketball programs. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's just so challenging and so difficult to watch them struggle and, uh, you know, be told what to do and what not to do. And when you have the big box stores kind of, you know, I guess we can't say business as usual because they are taking on some of the safety measures, but have never missed, never batted an eye. They've been open throughout this and, you know, some have amended their hours and, and done some of the safety things, but it's still, you know, that's, I don't know. I have a little problem with that discrimination, if you will between the smaller business and the big business. Yep. All right, we will open it up to uh, our assembled guests here. Does anybody have any questions for Senator Zay while he's with us? If not, I, I will ask say, more. I was gonna say, as a state, it appears that we've done pretty well. You know, you haven't seen that many people up on the state house. 
Um, most of the people seem to, you know, try to be following the rules. I was just wondering what your perspective was as a state. How do you think Indiana is handling this? I, um, yeah, we touched on that a little bit. I would have been, um, at least from an information standpoint, would have liked to be a little more involved a little bit earlier and have some sense of direction of what we're doing. Because as a senator, as, a, as our representatives, there's 150 of us out there that are kind of the retail politicians, if you will. And so a lot of these state directives, the, the constituents come to us wanting answers. And, and a lot of times we don't have them. So we're circumventing all that through a series of questions through to the agencies or to the governor. So I would have liked um, personally to see that come. Um, but in totality, you know, yeah, I think overall it's been pretty good. I would have liked um, a little bit earlier released to some of the rural parts of the state. Um, in my home county, you know, we, we've been very, very steady. And um, that we've had two deaths overall that have been tied to COVID. And I think we're at uh, somewhere between 17, 19, um, total positive tests. So, um, you know, I, I just feel that, you know, maybe the small businessman in me creeping out, if you will, but it was, you know, we were maybe a little bit ready, ready to go sooner. And so I, I, I guess I would have been hopeful that uh, maybe we could have sectioned off the state a little bit earlier as far as reopening and let some of the rural communities open first. But overall, you know, I, you, you see it in the governor, you see it in the doctor's advice, we, we see it in our friends and neighbors. The uncertainty is just crazy around this. There's just, you know, there's a twist every week. And, you know, ventilators used to be the thing. Now testing's kind of the thing. And it's like, well, if you're sick, you're sick. The test, yeah, it may tell you, but that's only a snapshot for that moment. So, you know, we're all, we are all learning, adjusting, and adapting as we move forward. But, uh, you know, I, I think overall, you know, it's been good. The, these process, meat processing plants are scary. I think we had another one creep up in the southern part of the state the other day, the Logansport thing. Um, was a difficult challenge and um, you know the states responded efficiently effectively and uh, you know you try and do the best you can and uh, work with the uh, health community to do that. Thank you for the question Pam. I'm gathering that the state didn't have like a pandemic response thing so is that something you guys are going to create now? I mean obviously we've learned a lot and they say you know things like this may happen in the future so is that something you guys are looking at? I, well, I'm sure it will. We actually, there is um, one of our summer study committees through the Legislative Council last week will be on the uh, COVID response. And so we will take, I think, a historical look at, at how it came about, how we responded, and uh, put that into play. Now, one thing that has occurred since, um, what, 9-11 is the Homeland Security um, Division. So they're always looking at different types of you know, broader effects and natural disasters and that. This is certainly unique in um, being a pandemic. And um, I don't know that even federally we had a plan for this. So, you know, that's a debate for another day maybe. But, the, but they're, you know, we're always planning. We're always talking about these scenarios. And we've had a lot of societal issues that have come in front of us where we're, we're planning whether, you know, it's the unfortunate thing of school shootings, whether it's um, terrorists, terrorism. And now we have, um, you know, something like this with a pandemic. And uh, these are all unique experiences, and we, we have to make sure we're as positioned as best we can. And, uh, you know, there's some, there's some lessons that have been learned already, and I think we will uh, heed that both from the federal, state, and uh, certainly down to the local level. Other questions from our assembled guests? Ross, I always hit you up for a question because I know you have them. All right, I'll, I'll ask one. Uh, Thanks, Brad, and thank you, Senator Zay, for joining us. I just uh, left another Zoom meeting, and it was a, a coalition of different uh, companies and uh, trade associations involved in the highway construction industry, and it's not polite to name drop, but our guest was the CFO of NDOT, uh, Broussard, Dan Broussard, and he threw out some points that uh, part of the group I think was aware of, others were not. And uh, Dan had to go to another meeting, was unable to answer any questions, but I noticed from the House Republican page that you're on the Appropriations Committee, if that's still yes. correct. Yes. And uh, I thought I might just run a couple things by you to maybe uh, make sure I noted them correctly and get your opinion on the likelihood of them happening. Um, Mr. Broussard mentioned that uh, 
the governor has an authority to impose revi uh, reversions on state budget items. And then he mentioned something else. I may have the name wrong. The, the state finance committee can actually take away money that's been budgeted or allocated to state agencies. So I was just going to ask you, do you think the reserve that you guys wisely built up is going to be able to withstand that, withstand this, or are those kind of measures going to be needed and reduce the services that government provides and projects that they build, et cetera? Well, I, I, great question, and, uh, and I think it's too early to answer some of it. But uh, I think the, the reality that we all are going to uh, need to understand, whether it's um, local schools, the state government, and hopefully the federal government at some point, we, we're going to be living next year, in, in, in our, which is our near term, because that will, that will be creation of a budget next year. But we're going to be looking at uh, lesser budgets and lesser funds. Um, we haven't had um, gambling revenue now for two months and, and the likelihood of that um, community getting back together, enjoying the casinos and in turn creating tax revenue for the state is, is still months off. Um, even when they open, uh, I think you're looking at a very s slow trickle. Maybe not. Maybe it'll be pent up demand, but we'll have to see on that. And that's just one example. I mean, the, the thing that we're fighting right now, we were off um, about a billion dollars in our April collections was the number uh, that we were given. So the, the question that I, that I had is, is the deferral of that because the state emulated the federal government in pushing back the deadline to July 15th. And what I did hear is that that was off about two, two thirds. And so what, I guess what I'm saying is ideally of that, of that billion dollars, we can still, we hopefully will still collect about two thirds of that. Um, so that'll still leave a short three, 400 million. And when you're talking about 2 billion in reserve, that sounds pretty good. But I think you're gonna see lesser gas tax, you're going to see lesser income tax, you're going to see lesser sales tax throughout the year. So we're going to continue to miss um, budget revenue projections throughout the year. So how we're going to be able to sustain that, um, I don't know. Now what I do know is we do have a lot of federal dollars in the state right now. The CARES Act funds were uh, distributed to Indiana in um, late April because those need to be distributed within 30 days of the passing of the CARES Act on March 27th. So the governor had $2.6 billion. 200 of that was already earmarked for um, Indianapolis and uh, Marion County, which you guys may benefit from some of that. Um, and the other 2.1, the governor already, or 2.4, the governor already committed 300 million out to uh, cities and counties throughout Indiana. So the question now will be what they're gonna do with that 2.1 billion within the CARES Act. And then the other, um, I think there's another one, one and a half billion that has come through education grants, through um, FEMA, through different organizations. And then there's also, I mean, it's been $5 billion, almost $5 billion total. So some of those have gone directly from the federal government to hospital systems and health systems and different agencies. So that's a lot of money. That may bridge some gaps. It might get us through this year. But I, I just don't see an economic reality that says that, you know, we're going to go back financially within our budgets to kind of business as usual, if you will. So I think you're going to look, um, and, and will the reserve help? Absolutely. But the key is going to be time here. How, how can we drag this out? How can we utilize some of those federal funds? How can we utilize our reserve to get us through a year, two years, three years? And, uh, you know, much as the rollout coming out of the shutdown, you know, it, it's all about timing. You know, we're still encouraging social distancing. We're still encouraging and wearing masks and those kinds of things. And that can continue, what, one month, six months? We don't know. It's really the same, in my mind, same attitude or perception we need to take with funding. It's going to be, it's going to be definitely a challenge. But uh, to say we're going to jump right back to where we were, I mean, obviously we're hopeful as the economy opens. But the, the challenging part of this economy, you know, which the top golf story comes back to mind. I mean, you got Top Golf, you got Ruoff, um, the entertainment center. We're talking about, you know, college football. We're talking about the Colts, um, high school football. I mean, th there's an entertainment industry and, um, and, you know, within Indiana and within our country, honestly, 
that there's a lot of people employed and a lot of service providers that are providing food and drink and what have you around these venues. And uh, at what point or how are we going to get that confidence to get those things back in play? And uh, I, that's going to be a challenge. And, and I don't know, you know, you know, there's a lot of discussion up in my communities about the 4-H fair. You know, it was exciting that they were letting them do them, but there's so many restrictions on them that now a lot of the counties are still canceling those fairs. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of tax dollars and different um, dollars that surround those things. So, you know, I think we can build trucks. We can get those supply lines going up here. We've got orthopedics. We'll be doing that kind of stuff. And, and uh, the tech folks probably, have, you know, continue to do a lot of what they did in some of your neighborhoods. And we can kind of beef up the manufacturing. And I can, I can see that coming back and that part of the economy. But it's a social economy that's going to be difficult. And, you know, that might be your wineries. That might be your, your brew houses. That might be your, your football games this fall. Maybe even some baseball in, in July and August. And those are, those are real jobs, and, and those are some economic drivers as well. And those won't come back uh, very quickly from, from the regulation standpoint and what the governor's putting out and from the comfort, comfort standpoint that all of us feel comfortable being together in a, in a crowd or in a community again. Thank you for the information. Yeah, thank you, Russ. Now, uh, Senator, you also sit on the uh, Senate Education Committee. What discussions have you had or what's your opinion on what education is going to look like come this fall? I know obviously Sheila, my girlfriend, is a, is a teacher and they're not getting a lot of guidance. They're saying maybe every other day, maybe half the students, but yeah, in a school setting, you've got a common cafeteria where all the kids go. Distancing's hard. No, exactly. And I am presently not on education committee, but I always have my hands in education. I've worked on a lot of policy. I'm, I'm working on a, a huge policy for the last two years, hoping to bring some federal dollars into our state to help fund IEPs and special needs to the tune of uh, hundreds to $200 million. But uh, speaking specifically to education, the governor, I think, kind of set a deadline for himself coming up uh, here in mid-March. Um, I think he's been meeting with uh, Dr. McCormick and, and her team and uh, seeing how they're going to do that. There've been some preliminary pr proposals. We've certainly seen that at the higher ed level with uh, Mitch Daniels and Purdue and a few others. I think Notre Dame had an announcement this week um, and how and what they're going to try and do. The K through 12 space is gonna be a little different. Um, you know, I haven't weighed in. I did speak with somebody about it last night. You know, I think the locals are gonna have to, you know, do some work and see how and what they wanna do in that regard. And, and from the state's vantage point, and I've never been a firm believer in this policy, but I think this may be a good year to say, hey, let's go after Labor Day. Let's give our schools time to reacclimate. I don't think any of them have gotten together. I mean, maybe a lot, certainly a lot by Zoom, but if they're gonna open up in their physical facilities, give them a little more training, time and training together. Um, give the communities a little more time and training together throughout August. Some of that was creeping up all the way to early August um, where the schools were starting. And again, I wouldn't make that uh, state statute or anything because I'd never voted for that and uh, the state dictating when schools would start. But I do think this year that might be a good time frame to, to give our K through 12 schools. But beyond that, you know, I, it's just going to be, I think we, we can't put it off much longer. I think, um, you know, I think some uh, commitments need to be made pretty soon, which is why you're, you know, certainly why we're seeing the announcements and the uh, steps that higher ed's taking. But we're, we're still still going to have those challenges in that K through 12 space. And, you know, particularly if we're still in a, you know, strong social distancing mode and uh, masks and those kinds of things, are those going to be a part of the uh, school, the K through 12 environment? Some of our teachers are older. How are we going to work with them if they're in that vulnerable class as far as are they going to be able to do some of this Zoom teaching or, you know, how, how are those things going to work out? And there's, there's people better positioned, better equipped than myself to do that. But I think we need to try and provide them the tools and the planning time and uh, the professionalism to allow them to do that. How much of uh, education do you think is going to shift online? Uh, just conversationally, uh, the, the conversation uh, with some of my colleagues and some others, um, there's been conversations somewhere between 10 to 20 percent. Um, we'll shift to some sort of homeschooling or virtual schooling. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, a lot of those things, when you're talking about new normal, I think that's one thing that, you know, might be a part of that discussion, that new normal. 
Um, yeah, I don't really like that term myself, but people have done it now. So they, they've maybe never thought about that, but the, the families have had the experience of that, um, particularly some in your sales community. I think a lot of the salesmen have been giving a lot of deference to working out of homes. And so, you know, where you have a little bit of that, uh, maybe you have a, a parent in the house and that homeschooling where they found they've made that work. Some families have made that work the last few months and they think that maybe it's been a very positive experience. So it's something that they would try going forward. Um, so, I, but that's, you know, again, that's just conversation. It's not hard numbers, but that, you know, it's also going to draw right into the, uh, the budget questions that uh, Mr. Snyder was asking about a few moments ago because you're going to have a, a huge shift in, in funding and uh, you know, and it's, and it's not going to be consistent. So it's not, you're taking 10% and an even swath throughout education all across the state. You know, some pockets are going to be a lot higher and some are going to be a lot lower. Cassandra, did you have a question? I do. Um, this is about PPP and guidance from the SBA, Senator Jay. I am a small business owner and okay that they had us apply for those funds and do that calculation as an LLC, they're now changing how it will be calculated for loan forgiveness. So every single, you know, LLC, I have several subcontractors, we're all going to owe money back um, because calculated it one way for application, calculating it another way for forgiveness. And so I'm just trying to see are there avenues where we could voice those concerns so that as we continue to get guidance from SBA, because I know I'm only a little over two and a half weeks away from, you know, when I'm supposed to submit my loan forgiveness paperwork. And I've talked to several small business owners and we're all going to be in the same boat. We're all going to be paying some of that money back. Well, it's always a concern and, you know, Dang it, promises made, promises kept. Do what you're going to say you're going to do. But I think in rolling out the PPP, they amended that 10 or 12 different times. So I think we it isn't critical we work with our federal counterparts. Uh, Jim Banks was just on here a week or two ago. I know Jim very well, and I certainly will be reaching out to him. I did see the guidelines that you mentioned. I just came, that came to me through my banker. And, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, there, w there will probably be some changes made. We need to look at that. The, the plus side is, I think if we do owe some money back, um, and hopefully for you it's not much, um, I think we can defer that over 24 months. So, I mean, the, the payback time would be very, very liberal from that standpoint and, and drag it out. I mean, as really with any crisis in life, I think what we're looking at now is time. We've, we've simply got to try and manage and, and get through, you know, it used to be get through the next year. Right now, it's get through the next few weeks, get through the next month. And, um, you know, I, I'm hoping a lot of these conversations will change. Um, let's get the governor off TV. We're not talking about uh, talking about it as much anymore. Let's, let's say we're doing what we're doing. Let's get some groups together, see what the impact is. Hopefully none or very nominal. And, uh, you know, and I, and I know that's what they're watching closely now because we are reopening. And um, some of us are doing a better job and a worse job with masks and, and the distancing. And some of us are taking it a, little, a lot more seriously, some not as much. So, you know, um, I want to get the I want to get the daily death rate down to single digits. I want to get the infection rate down to double digits. And let's get, see if we can get this thing to disappear. And, and, and that's just speaking optimistically. I mean, I, I get it. I, I know that it's real, but... I just hope we can get to that and then we can get back, Cassandra, to when we're talking about a little more business as usual. And I, and I know it'll be different, but, you know, we need to start focusing on what, what, our, what our talent, what our trade is. And uh, we're worrying about a lot of ex existential things now that are very difficult, including, you know, paying back the PPP or how that's going to apply. But, um, you know, I think there's also potentially some other relief programs coming along. Um, hopefully at the local and state level. And that's what, uh, that's what the governor, I think, and his team is working on right now. But, but a very valid point. I think we need to continue to reach up line and, and they're, gonna, they're gonna, I think they're probably gonna amend it a few more times. If, if, if history is any a telling tale of what comes forward, the federal government certainly has done that. But in, in their defense, I mean, this has all happened very quickly. All happened very quickly. I mean, I, when we left Indianapolis, this was narrow discussion. And three days later, we were shutting things down. 
I mean, we sat in caucus for hours. We finished up our session at midnight. And uh, going back, I think, I actually, I think Senator Sandlin, there may have been one or two discussions on this at all, in all our private meetings and all our public meetings. And man, three days later, here we are shutting things down, dealing with this crazy crisis. So with that, Senator, uh, we've only got a couple minutes left. Um, obviously, Lawrence has one of the largest reservoirs in the state, Geist Reservoir, within our catchment area. Advice on how to be a good bo good boating guest. Be a good boating guest. Well, hey, boating's great social distancing, I, I, I would hope. Uh, you know, I guess some of the sandbars at some of these lakes, uh, you know, it'll be, again, going back to enforcement, see how exciting our – how excited our conservation officers get, but uh, you know, I, I again, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm optimistic, I'm hopeful there. You know, with summer, you know, there, the discussion's gone both ways whether the heat and the humidity will burn off the virus, but uh, certainly it'll all make us feel hopefully better to get out and be active, whether it's the trails, whether it's the lakes, and uh, we can feel. You know, things will be different, but we can feel some sort of normalcy. And, the, you know, there's economies going around all these lakes. Um, we have a bunch up here in northern Indiana and um, throughout the state. And uh, we need to get those, you know, those micro economies going that are, you know, three, four month economies. And, and some of them aren't. And that's going to be a problem. And that's where, you know, that's where these fairs and, and all that stuff, that's, those are real economies. I mean, whether it's the elephant air vendor and, uh, um, down to, you know, people providing security at these events. But th those are dollars churning through the economy that, you know, thus far aren't going to be happening. I mean, Fort Wayne's canceled all their festivals all the way into the fall already. Almost all of our communities have canceled their festivals. I think there is one up, a smaller one up the road that is going to hang on to theirs in, in mid to late June. But, uh, you know, we, we've got to be careful, but um, we, we've just got to find our way through this. And um, somehow we've got to keep you know, we've got to try and get some of these gatherings together safely. And, and we, we've got to see what happens. We've got to try some of this. And I, and I hate to put that out there like we're all guinea pigs, but um, the impact just here in some of my rural areas has not been that big. And so there's a lot of farmers and others that are just really, really cooped up right now. And it's, they've been very aggressive. Not crazy, not crazy enough to go to, to Indy, but uh, what I'm hearing about it. Let's say that. Okay, well, I'm hearing more and more of that coming. With that, Senator Zay, thank you very much for joining us. This has been uh, fabulous. We appreciate you being here. Uh, for everyone else that's on this call, no um, upcoming events. Tonight's uh, cruise in, we have postponed just due to the overcast, cool weather. We will try to do it again next week. Uh, next Wednesday's guest will be Lawrence Common Council President Lisa Chavis. So please put that on your calendar and uh, be sure to join us. So thank you all for attending and hopefully we'll see you next week. Good to see you all. Thanks for having me and uh, have a great weekend. Great holiday weekend.